just, uh, you got to remember your preacher's still learning about you guys. So uh, I'm looking at everybody being gone, and, and I have to wonder, you know, I'm still making that transition from Montana to here. So um, uh, here's what's happening in Montana as I speak. Uh, yesterday was opening day. Now, who knows what opening day would be? Hunting. Hunting, yes. So, uh, so all my buddies out in Montana have already started to post pictures. Uh, one of my preacher buddies got himself an antelope yesterday. Uh, they, they've had a shoulder season already for elk and they've gotten elk. But typically this time of year in Montana, uh, you will see 60% of your congregation disappear from opening week for the next five weeks. And so, is it opening weekend? <laughs> Where is everybody? I mean, where'd those men go? Where are they? Where are they? You know, not all the men are gone. I'm just saying, where are they? So that's one of the things I've gotten used to. And then Gina, Gina got me this morning. It's really kind of interesting. Uh, and I figured somebody would would make a comment that because for those of you who are visiting with us this morning, uh, some of our folks, uh, one fellow in particular, is in the hospital, Thomas, and uh, Thomas uh, had a stroke on the operating table and uh, is in ICU in Oak Ridge, and I made several trips this week uh, up there and back, and so Gina was talking about the busy week, and, and uh, I, you have to fill her in. I didn't tell her this story. Here's just a typical Montana preacher's hospital visit. Uh, in this case, Suzanne went with me. We left Lewistown, drove 130 miles to Billings, Montana, and uh, stopped at hospital number one uh, because one of our gals had cancer and she was going in for some surgery, and, and so we were there. And, uh, uh, and then uh, we went to hospital number two. There was another family that was in that hospital in Billings. We then hopped in the car and drove 220 miles from Billings to Great Falls uh, for uh, next hospital visit. And, and uh, one of the uh, retired preachers, he's one of the fellows in the church, uh, he had a major scare. We didn't know it at this point. We then drove to uh, 100 miles back to Lewistown. And it was a big triangle. So we drove 100 miles back to Lewistown. Uh, there was uh, one of the elders was in the hospital in Lewistown, and it's small. It's about it's the big city, but the hospital there is about 20 to 25 beds. And uh, and then I got word that Lee, the retired preacher at Great Falls, had had a setback. Uh, uh, we were afraid he was going to die at that point, and so I drove that 100 miles back to Great Falls that night, and that was one day. Now it helps that in Montana, I could drive those first 130 miles just to let you know, I made that in about an hour and a half, and uh, you do the math, and, and if you're not quick, that's about 85 miles an hour. And then, um, and then the 220 miles on average, yeah, yeah. And then the 220 miles to Great Falls was just under three hours. So uh, you can drive a little faster there in greater distances. It's different. It's different. So, uh, so going to Oak Ridge, what, how, how many miles is that anyway? Yeah, that's 30 miles. That's like, you know, that's going to get you your gas. That's the thing. Yeah. Well, actually, it's not like going to Walmart. You have to drive two hours in order to get to Walmart. Yeah. And that's in three different directions. And we were the big city. I just want to remind you, Lewistown, Montana was the county seat. But Fergus County, Montana, is the size of Connecticut. And there's only 12,000 people in it. So, a little different. But it is opening weekend in Montana. I am having withdrawals. You need to pray for your preacher. <laughs> <laughs> Yesterday, I would have been out on a hill on milk. And I'm here. Oh, no, this is... <laughs> oh, I'm just playing with it. Okay, uh, we're continuing our sermon series on the power of story. And just so you know, we're in the book of Job. Go ahead and turn to Job, the 38th chapter. Now, there's a little bit of a tie-in here. I'm borrowing heavily some, from some videos from the I Am Second website. And we're going to look at one of those this morning. 
But the power of story today, the title is, um, who's first? We're, we're getting close to wrapping this up. We've got one more sermon, and uh, we're going to wrap this up. But at this point, we need to be asking ourselves, who's first? And I'll go ahead and give you a hint. The, the question needs to be asked from a personal point of view for each and every one of us. Who's first in my life? Now, before I read Job chapter 38, I just want to remind you of the background. Job starts off with God bragging to Satan about how great Job is in his faithfulness to God. So we're talking about a guy who was pretty good in his faith. So much so, God's bragging on him, and then Satan says, oh yeah? And then comes the rest of the story. And you, you remember the rest of the story. Again, just for review, he loses his ten children, he loses his wealth, he loses his health, he loses everything, and life is pretty bad for Job. And it starts off with a bunch of questions. Why is this happening to me? His friends are saying, this is happening to you because you must have messed up some way. And he does. He eventually does mess up. We, we touched on that last week. Uh, Job starts the question in God. And so he messes up. So who's first? Job chapter 38, verse 1. I just dare you, any one of you, to invite God to do this in your life. Uh, number one, it might be a challenge. Uh, number two, I'm guessing uh, you might have to go to the cleaners afterwards. You know, <laughs> It's not going to be a pretty picture. And especially when you read verse 1. Then the Lord answered Job, because we've just left that passage. And Job is just he's kind of chewing on God. We, uh, he, he just spent a couple of chapters just chewing on God. So then uh, the Lord answered Job out of the whirlwind and said, and we've already read this passage before, but we'll go a little bit further today. Who is this that darkens counsel by words without knowledge? Dress for action like a man. You know, some of your, uh, some of your passages say, yeah, gird up yourself like a man. Gird up your loins. I will question you and you make it known to me. In other words, you come up with the answers. Where were you when I laid the foundation of the earth? Tell me if you have understanding. Who determined this measurement? Surely you know. You know, this guy who's been chewing on me for two chapters. This Job guy, I'm questioning you now. Um, who laid it all out? You've got the answers, don't you? Or who stretched the line upon it? On what were its bases sunk? Or who laid its cornerstone when the morning stars sang together? And all the sons of God shouted for joy? Or who shut in the sea with doors when it burst out from the womb, when I made clouds its garment? Isn't that very nice, very poetic? I mean, that's pretty language, isn't it? And thick darkness its swaddling band and prescribed limits for it set bars and doors and said, Thus far shall you come and no farther. And here shall your proud waves be stayed. Have you commanded the morning since your days began? And caused the dawn to know its place, that it might take hold of the skirts of the earth? And the wicked be shaken out of it? It is changed like clay under the seal, and its features stand out like a garment. From the wicked their light is withheld, and their uplifted arm is broken. Have you entered into the springs of the sea, or walked in the recesses of the deep? Have the gates of death been revealed to you? Or have you seen the gates of deep darkness? Have you comprehended the expanse of the earth? Declare if you know all this. And by the way, I should mention at this point, that's just the beginning. I mean, he goes, I mean, he even goes further in this. He talks about Leviathan and Behemoth, you know, which may be the crocodile and the, and the you know, hippopotamus, we don't know. You know, some people think it's dinosaurs, and we, we don't know. It's just, he's just describing these fantastic beasts. He talks about the, the Pleiades, he talks about constellations. 
I mean, he just, he just wows, he awes Job in the midst of this. You have to, you know, just say, wow. Wow. Man, what a passage. I mean, what an experience. But let me ask you, would you want to go through this? I mean, really. You know, here you are, and, and, and maybe you're dealing with something in your life, and, and come back. Have you questioned God at times in your life? I can raise my hand. Uh, I don't know if you're brave enough to do it in yours. But have you, yeah, have you questioned God? I mean, why is this happening to me? And, and we understand, we, we say that's human. But, you know, this is Old Testament. I have to tell you, we're New Testament people. I think there's a lesson here, and Job has taught us the lesson, or Job learned the lesson, and we can learn from him. And, and so here's Job's big lesson. What do you think it is? I mean, what do you think Job is really dealing with here? Why would God do this? And, and like I said, we've, we've read part of this passage before, and God is just awing Job. He's just, it's that shock and thunder just to kind of wake him up and say, hey, remember, I'm God. You're not. Right? I mean, that's what God is doing. So, wow, you know, what's his big lesson? And it's quite simply this. Who's first, really, Job? I, I just, I'm God. You know, I'm paraphrasing. I'm not saying I'm God, just so you know. <laughs> People get in trouble for that. Uh, now, who's first in your life? Really? Um, you know, we Christians gather together on a weekly basis. Um, but in America, the numbers are looking worse and worse all the time. Did you know that, you know, and I grew up in a much different time. I, I feel for you guys. Just going into ministry, but um, when I was a kid, it was different. And some of you can say it was even different, even further back. But in order to be considered a regular attender at church, that's a regular, that's somebody who comes on a consistent basis. I did not say weekly basis. You only attend one in eight weeks. That's considered a regular attender. And here's the scary thing. Even here in the Bible Belt, on average, in the United States, only 17.7% of the public attends church on a regular basis. That's one out of eight weeks. That's kind of scary. You get to places like Seattle, it's 2.3%. It's scary. That's different. I mean, you know, and, it's, and by the way, I am not one of those people who believes that Christianity is measured by whether you give on a regular basis. Uh, I shouldn't say just. I should say just measured. It's not by church attendance, how much you give, whether you read your Bible every day. No, I think those are just markers or just indicators that this thing we call Christianity. Um, involves a relationship with Christ and it just so happens that those things are markers for it. But what is Christianity? When we are, as, as C said this morning, when we are saved by grace through Jesus Christ, what should change in our I want you to watch this testimony. It's a little on the long side. Um, but pay attention to what this young man, this former soldier, what he has to say about God being first. I thought they were correct on saving that guy's life. And you know, sometimes I sit there and I'm like, you know, that, that's probably what a Christian would do. And yet, I didn't have the guts to do it. You think you really know God, and there's just those moments where 
I went from this place of being a fan of God when I was 22 just to have this incredible faith where life went from black and white to vivid color. It just became such a powerful thing in my life in the Army. I mean, the Army kind of sometimes runs a little contradictory towards that. So I just made this call, this decision that the only thing in life that I really wanted to do was share the gospel. And so I find myself getting out of the Army and I'm, I'm in Korea and my colonel gives me a call and he's like, Chris, I want you to take command of this company. So there's that moment, sure, you know what, I'll do one more year, and, you know, it's going to hurt. It's a great leadership experience. Well, 12 days after I take command, my colonel gives me another call. Hey, Chris, I need you to make an assessment of your man. I can't tell you why, but you can probably figure it out. Figure what out? Well, he saw me I was going to war, going to Iraq. A couple months later, I find myself in the sandbox of Iraq. And I'm now the commander of 100 men, 21 tanks, 7 Bradleys, which are like mini tanks, and a handful of Humvees. I'll never forget staying outside my command post that first day of combat. Uh, I was watching just heat waves. I mean, it's hot. Heat waves are bouncing off the minarets of the mosque. It's 125 degrees outside. And there are my tanks. We're all out in the sector. I mean, here, I'm, I'm doing this. You know, this is, this is real. And I glanced down at my watch to make sure everything's okay. And boom, a massive explosion erupts about a quarter mile out. And smoke and fire build with this mushroom cloud about 250 feet high. <sighs> Immediately, I run into my command post. I'm trying to figure out the situation reports what exactly is going on. And there's three letters that you never want to hear creep across the radio combat. And that's KIA. Kill in action. The first four minutes, I lose my first soldier. Immediately, I run and I go grab my M4 carbon rifle, my 9mm pistol. I put my flak vest on and I sprint down my tank. And I charge that 50 caliber machine gun. My loader takes a 45 pound, 120 millimeter round, and puts it in the breach of the main gun. My gutter toggles the switches on the computer while my driver pushes that 72 ton beast of machine 43 miles an hour. I line three tanks up a launch to pound the North Shore, that thing we got. These terrorists start to withdraw the North. I send two tanks across the river to follow. I follow my tank. 100 men behind me start searching house to house to house to house to house. And after about seven hours of search, we find I'm emotionally drained because I just lost my first soldier. You know? I gotta go home and go back to the barracks and write a letter home to his to his wife Michaela and 13 year old daughter Sarah, explaining them how I let their father and husband die. You know, you got you got one job as a military leader, and that's to bring back everyone I'm alive. In the first four minutes of that I fail. And uh, spiritually, I'll be honest with you, it kind of felt like. You know, God took a day off. You know, when, when I came to faith in Christ, you know, at 22, we kind of had to deal. So here I am, six years later, and it kind of feels like that whole thing about I'll never leave you, forsake you, it, it's, it's kind of church dark jargon now. But where are you in the moment of where my companies were in battle and in combat, and I lose somebody, and there's that sense of you're on vacation. I was constantly out in the sector, my uniform's white with sweat, I'm frustrated, I'm tired, and I don't even feel like I'm a Christian at all. I feel like, you know, I'm not praying, I'm not reading my Bible, I'm, I'm struggling here. And don't forget, I made a decision, I said, I went up to my, my second man, um, my executive officer, I said, Adam, check it out, man, I'm going to go down to the chapel every morning. I'd take one chair here, and I'd set the other chair here, and i just, I just sit there and I'd talk to God, I'd be like, you know what? This one time uh, we are out in the sector, the car doesn't explode. In fact, there's something wrong or he miscalibrated. Somehow the detonator didn't work and he rams the car straight into the tank. And you know, this is a two and a half ton car running to a 72 ton tank. He loses, he's knocked out. The entire gas tank explodes. We have a massive inferno moving from the rear of the car to the front of the car where all these bombs are. And so this terrorist rolls out of the car because he wakes up because the heat must be just incredible. And he's starting to roll away from the blast. And there's a moment. I'm not going to lie to you. There's a moment I could have saved his life. I, I, I saw it. And there's just a moment I said, I'm not willing to die for my enemy right now. I'm not willing to do it. And uh, so I watched him. The explosion erupted. And we watched his body ripped apart. And after the explosion, the dust settled. I jump off my tank and sprint up to his body. And I watched crimson and fill the sand. I 
I'm that terrorist. When it comes to how I've affected my life towards God, I've been an enemy of Him. And yet, He didn't sit back in His tank and just watch me die. Life is so short and so urgent, and we have just this need to share the hope that we have with people who have no clue. I look at that, that terrorist, oh, there's no way that I would ever go and save that guy's life. Because I'm not that kind of a hero. I'm not willing to go and risk my life for an enemy. Yet, Christ did that very thing for me. So I owe him everything. And that's why he's first in my life. Because he was willing to do what I never was able to do. I am Chris Pleckenbull, and I am second. What a powerful story. <clears throat> I mean, think about that. Um, you know, especially with uh, with what's going on in our election. Uh, a lot of folks are uh, making a big deal about Muslims and terrorists and enemies. And, and here's a guy who's been there. I mean, he's fought the fight. It's not like he hasn't lived through it. And... Uh, God does to him shock and awe. The same thing that he did with Job and the same thing he's done with countless people over the centuries. Um, so at some point in his life, Chris woke up to the fact that uh, uh, he's no different in his relationship with God before Christ than that terrorist is to him. And, and he didn't say it, but you heard it, didn't you? I mean, what he's talking about is he wasn't willing to say, risk his life to save that terrorist, but Jesus Christ was willing to save us as terrorists. That's amazing, isn't it? That's shock and awe. What Jesus Christ has done for us is shock and awe. He is first, or he ought to be first. <clears throat> but do we really, do we really make him first? Here's, uh, just to make you a little hopeful. I think we spend our lives, once, we, once we're introduced to Christ, I think we are to spend the rest of our lives just discovering how to make him first. And each day is a battle. Each day has its victories. Each day has its failures. But each day ought to build upon the previous day. I, I, here's a little self-review. You should ask yourself, each one of us should, am I different than I was last year as a Christian? Some of us can say, am I different than I was 10 years ago, or 20, or 30, or 40, or whatever. Am I more mature? Does my life, does my life reflect more that Christ is first in my life than it did 10 years ago? And do you, you know, what does it mean in order for Christ to be first? Uh, number one, I think um, we're going to care about the things he cares about. It, and therefore was the hint with Chris. <laughs> Chris is letting us know we have to care for people the way Christ cares for people. I think after this revelation, my guess would be that if Chris went back to the sands of Iraq, he'd run out there to try and save that terrorist mission. What would you do different? And we're going to hit a couple of things here. We're, we're not quite wrapped up. But I want to watch another video. And, and I have to tell you, this guy is an atheist. As a matter of fact, he is a famous atheist. I've met him. I've sh shook his hand. Um, he's uh, he's a, a great guy. He's a comedian, and he's also a magician. But uh, And I've gone to a show in Vegas. And he does a phenomenal show, but boy, does he pick on Christianity. And you know what he picks on? 
it, it, the truth is, is he's not really picking on on Christianity, the Jesus part of it. What he's picking on is churchianity. The Christians who don't quite get it. And, and that's one of the things that I found as I as I listened to what he had to say. But listen to this little it's a it's, if you know what it is. The young people know what this is. It's a blog. It's a video blog. And uh, and he says something that's just very profound. <coughs> And I wanted you to have this. I'm kind of uh, proselytizing. I mean, he said I'm a businessman. I'm, I'm sane. I'm not crazy. And he looked me right in the eye and did all of this. And uh, it was really wonderful. I believe he knew that I was an atheist. And I've always said, you know, that I, I don't respect people who don't proselytize. I don't respect that at all. If you believe that there's a heaven and hell, and people could be going to hell, or not getting eternal life, or whatever, and you think that, uh, well, it's not really worth telling them this because it would make it socially awkward. And atheists who think that people should proselytize, just leave me alone, keep your religion to yourself. Uh, how much do you have to hate somebody to not proselytize? How much do you have to hate somebody to believe that everlasting life is possible and not tell them that? I mean, if I believed, you know, a shadow of a doubt, that a truck was coming at you and you didn't believe it, if that truck was bearing down on you, there's a certain point where I tackle you. And this is more important than that. And I've always thought that, and I've written about that, I've thought of it conceptually. This guy was a really good guy. He was polite and honest and sane, and he cared enough about me to proselytize and give me a, a Bible, which had written in it a little note to me, uh, not very personal, but just, you know, like to show and so on. And then like five phone numbers for him and an email address if I wanted to get in touch. Now, I know there's no God, and one polite person living his life right doesn't change that. Uh, but I'll tell you, he was a very, very, very good man. And uh, that's really important. And with that kind of goodness, uh, it's okay to have that deep of a disagreement. I still think that religion does a lot of bad stuff, but man, that was a good man who gave me that book. That's all I wanted to say. If you didn't recognize him, that's Penn Gillette of uh, Penn and Teller, a famous magician. And like I said, he he doesn't pull any punches when he talks about his atheism. But isn't that interesting what he had to say? Have you ever thought about the fact that you hold the gospel, and by withholding it from someone else, that's equivalent to hatred? Is it? If you saw somebody, again, his, his analogy, if you saw somebody with a truck bearing down on them, and you didn't, and they didn't believe the truck was coming for them, uh, isn't it your responsibility to tackle them out of the way? Isn't that the same thing as eternity with Christ or eternity in hell? Who's first? <clears throat> Let me just add, I don't think that's the only thing the church has. Here's the funny thing about church. Here's, here's one of the reasons why I think in the United States we have lapsed into attendance being one out of every eight weeks, and that's a regular attender, that we're kind of committed to going to church. That's part of the problem is we've forgotten that we are the church. And church exists wherever we are. And wherever two or more are gathered, Christ is there with us. But we've also forgotten that the church, this, uh, and, and church, 
and for those of us uh, of us who were in a Bible study earlier, found out that about the Greek word baptism versus the English word baptism. Um, you should know about the Greek word for church. It's ecclesia. It's a conjunction. It's two different Greek words that are put together. One of the Greek words is kaleo. It means called out. To call. Ek means from. We are the called out ones. We're to be different than the rest of the world. But it doesn't mean we separate ourselves from the rest of the world. Christ said of his ecclesia, his called out ones, his, his bride, he said that the very gates of Hades would not stand against the church. I'm, not, I'm thinking that's power, don't you? I'm thinking we ought to think that we have power wherever we go and whatever we do. And we ought to act like we've got power behind us. But did you know that Jesus bragged on us just like God bragged on Job, but for God bragging on Job, it was after the fact. It's what Job had already done. And Jesus bragged on his church as to what we were going to do. Did you know that he bragged on you? And it's in a famous, famous passage. John chapter 13, 14, 15, and 16 is the greatest length of teaching that Jesus has. It probably happened in the upper room. And you remember what John 17 is. John 17 is this great high priestly prayer. It's where he prays not only for himself and his relationship with his father and what he's about to do, but then he prays for himself and the disciples who are with him. And then he prays for you and I. And John 13, 14, 15, and 16 is teaching about what we're going to do. And here it is, John 14, verses 12 through 14. Truly, truly, I say to you, whoever believes in me will also do the works that I do. Really, Jesus, you raise people from the dead. Really, Jesus, you, you heal people of sickness. Really, Jesus, we're going to do those things. Oh, wait. And greater works than these will he do. What's that mean? Because I am going to the Father. Well, that explains it a little bit. Whatever you ask in my name, this I will do. That the Father may be glorified in the Son. If you ask me anything in my name, I will do it. What is the church given up? We've given up the idea that church is a cause, not a place you go to. We've given up the idea that church has a purpose. And it's not just that you get entertained and you get a 45-minute 